Should we all bring our Bibles this morning? I would love you to open your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Let's go to verse uh, 24. We're all there. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever des- desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever, desires, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is what, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul or will a man give an exchange or what will a man give an exchange for his soul for the son of man will come in glory of his father with his angels and then he will reward each according to his works you know when we look at the cross when Jesus is saying to deny yourself and to follow me to pick up his cross If I see that cross, we know the cross is made up of those two pieces of wood. If I see the cross, this one part that goes down into the ground, that's God's will for my life. And then if I see this one that goes across here, that's my will for my life. And somewhere along the line, these two wills are going to converge. And one is going to deny itself, surrender its will, and follow Jesus. The other one is just going to go on that mission that way, heading that way, somewhere over that side. But somewhere when, when, when Jesus is talking to his people, he's saying, deny yourself, pick up your cross and to follow me. And somewhere there needs to be this, it's not just a concept, it's, it's not something I can give you the, the a teaching, the principles of how to. There's the reality of that work in my life when those situ- situations come to me and I'm faced with them, And I need to come. It's not something that you can see on the outside. But in in my heart, the will that I'm fighting with, I need to come to deny myself of my will, of what I want, and to put it at the foot of that cross and to say, yes, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. It's not possible. You you know, you, you, you you can be a Christian for 40 years and never be able to identify yourself with Jesus through denying oneself. It's incredible. But somewhere in that whole process, this is where we see maturity coming, where where my life is transformed. Why? Because I'm not living my life. I'm leaving my life. I'm taking off that old man, and I'm putting on a new man that God has for me. Through this identification in the cross, I'm able to identify with Jesus. It's not just because I say I believe in Jesus, now I'm like Jesus. There's a process of me denying myself, denying those carnal lusts, the thoughts, all of the things that I have as a natural man. I'm putting those things down, and I'm going to follow Jesus for that. It could be something so simple as my pride in an argument, in a, in a disagreement. I mean, once, once I know what that feels like, hey, my darling, my lovely wife. But... There can be a situation that happens. It's something so small, not you know, insignificant. But somewhere in this situation, I've taken a position. I've allowed my pride to get the best of me and the situation. And I've said something, I've done something in this. But the Holy Spirit in me is witnessing and testifying to my heart that says that is not right. And I can justify in my thoughts, I can justify, I can have principles, I can give you uh, Mackenzie versus Mackenzie examples, I can give you all of these things, true things that have happened. But the Holy Spirit is witnessing in my heart and it says that that is not right. What is it causing me to do? It's causing me to come to the cross, to come and to deny my pride, to deny myself being right, and to come and to put it down and to put that thing right. That pride may be pushed down in my life, that humility may take place. Humility may, is it even possible for it to rise up because it's so humble? But pride gets pushed down. My pride, my pride gets left at the cross and I come into a humble position and put that thing right. Amen. Are we all here? We're all here this morning. Because you can be a Christian 
for 45 years and never once deny yourself and put right in the situation, allowing humility and the life of Christ to be manifest in your life. It's shocking. People believe in Jesus, call themselves Christians. But when you come to church, you don't see Jesus. You don't feel Jesus. Why? Because there is no identification to the cross of Jesus and who Jesus is on that cross. Because I live my life, I say what I want, how I want, and I live as a carnal man, a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian. Those words should never be in the same sentence. Because a Christian should be pursuing that cross, living its life, denying himself, following Jesus. That my life may be stripped off, ripped off of me. You know, we all have our free will. When the Holy Spirit comes, it never arrests us, handcuffs us, and says, right, I'm taking your will from you. It doesn't do that. You're free. Adam and Eve, free in the garden. Free. And then Jesus, Jesus, God comes and says, what's going on? Why are you hiding? Why are you trying to hide from me? And already there's a separation there. But I lost my thread there. What was I saying before that? Hey. I'm just testing you. Yeah? <laughs> I'm just allowing God's will to take place right now. But we're talking about my will being put down. That's right. We're talking about my will not being arrested from me. It's something that I need to come to the cross and I need to surrender. I can't do it for you. I can't pay you to do it for me. And vice versa. It's something that happens in my heart. I come and I say, Lord, I want to do your will. I want to do your will. For me to answer and do his will, I have to do what? Put my will down. I cannot do both. I cannot say I identify with the crucifixion of the flesh when my flesh is alive. And it's, some Christians, sometimes we can be so frustrated in, in, in our Christian walk because nothing is happening. There's no action. No, no, no. There's plenty of action, but there's no victory. There is no victory in anything. I have struggles. Sometimes people say struggles and it's a singular. What they mean is it's plural. Normally when you have a struggle, it's just everything goes wrong. Chaos. But they have struggles and they never see the victory in things. They never see, they see it's as though we can identify with Jesus being crucified and the pain and anguish of that whole process. But we can never identify with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's where the victory happens. But we, we get so caught up in all of these things. And it's like, when, when, when do we raise the flag and have victory in this? It's because somewhere I'm holding on to my will. I'm doing it my way. I'm fighting. I'm fighting. We, we have an altercation. No, I'm right. You're wrong. Give you an opportunity be, to be humble. Huh? Ah, I just go around creating opportunities for people. Hey, everyone must be humble. It's my way. Then when you, have, when, you, when you have struggles in relationships, you wonder why there's never a breakthrough. It's because my will never gets put down. I never have a, a humble heart that says, okay, Lord, your will be done. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, 26 verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and praying, saying, O Father, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. How many of you can identify with that? O Lord, get me out of the situation. Lord, get me out of the struggles here. And then he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see the surrender that happens right there. He puts his will down because he wants the cup to pass. And then in that moment, nevertheless, 
not as I will, but as you will. So many times, church, we get to that point of surrender in our lives through situations. And as we are saying, Lord, it's my will, not yours. <laughs> and we deny that victory in the cross because I'm, I'm at that tipping point, that critical point where I'm about to surrender my will and just say, okay, Lord, I give up. I give in now. I give up fighting like this. I will accept what you want to do in my life. And we take that moment back and we remain right there wanting this cup to pass. Now that becomes my ministry. The cup must pass ministries. And everywhere I go, I try not to be in the situation that the Lord has allowed to happen. And sometimes we, we, we forget that the Lord allows things to happen in our lives so that we may go through these things. Not that we walk around and we walk around and we beat ourselves and condemnation comes and says, you will never do it, you will never get there. No, 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 put the Christian down. Downtrodden Christians. But when we're able to say, okay, Lord, the situation with my wife, she is present today, she's not in children's church. <laughs> hey? Hey? When I found out that, we added some extras. <laughs> and removed a number of paragraphs. It's a short service today. It's a short one. 15 minutes. <laughs> but it allows me to come back in that relationship and say, okay, okay. First of all, I want to put my heart right. Even if there's a situation in that, and I'm right maybe, but the way things have happened have brought a separation in our relationship. It's so important, church. It's so, so, so important. We'll get, we'll get down that in a short while. But understanding that when I'm able to give up my will, I'm now able to take up the will of Jesus in my life. Through that, that submission in, in this relationship, in this altercation, the one, the, one that, the one time, through that situation, I'm able to say, okay, Lord, do that work in me first. Let me come and put my heart right. I've put my will down, and I've taken up the will of Jesus in my life. And through that, the Spirit can witness and minister to our hearts in that situation. That's where there is victory in that moment. It's not about the battle that I've won, the argument, and how I've approached the argument. It's nothing about that. It's about having a surrendered heart that approaches a situation with all humility, that says, Jesus, I want your way in this issue. I want to see you manifest yourself in my relationship. Jesus can never manifest himself in a situation if he has never given the opportunity to, because it's my will. It's so full of pride. You know, it can be pride, it can be laziness, it can be so many things that stop me from allowing the Lord to do that miracle in my life, where it's a little bit of me that gets chipped away, and a little bit of Jesus that gets built in my life. That's what I want in my life. Now, it's one thing to say, we all want Jesus in our lives. Amen? Anyone here? It's another thing to live a life putting yourself down. Allowing Jesus, the, the, the spiritual man, to come up because they behave in completely different ways. The one wants to be united in heart and the other one wants to be right in everything that they do. But somewhere, church, the challenge comes to our hearts and it needs to come to our hearts every single day because it's not me, it's God's will for my life. How many times is that, do I get to the moment in that Garden of Gethsemane where it says, Lord, may the situation pass. May she just come and say, she's sorry. <laughs> and maybe she does. But the Holy Spirit is still impressing on my heart. Mm. And we don't move forward in that. I'll just sleep on it and then I'll be better tomorrow. It's not a cold. I'll take multivitamins and you'll be better tomorrow. You can't take tea tree oil. My mom always puts tea tree oil. For anything, everything, I have some tea tree oil on that. Tea tree oil is not going to do anything for you. You need to put your heart right. And somewhere when we start in this as a Christian, as I said, you might be 45 years old as a born-again Christian. The time needs to come when we start identifying to Jesus. 
And when you walk into a church and you see brothers and sisters that want to identify their hearts and their lives and everything about them to Jesus, there's a fragrance that comes in that place. Brothers and sisters, when we deny ourselves and allow the will of God to come in my heart and bring his life, there's a fragrance. There's a testimony that's attached. I can say words, but unless the Spirit can witness and testify through the work of that cross in my life, they mean nothing to you. Nothing. Just words. Just words. I can repeat the words of Jesus all day long. Are they the ones in your Bibles that are read? Yeah? I can say them all day long. It doesn't make me like Jesus. There is a process when I go through and I lose myself and I see what he wants to do in my life and I surrender myself. That's the point. I was sharing with a young man a couple weeks ago about ambition. But I have ambition in life. I want to go places. I want to do things. But I want to serve the Lord. So I said, what's the problem? Go for it. Serve Jesus. But Christians aren't supposed to have ambition. Nonsense. As long as that ambition is at the foot of the cross, you have all the ambition as you want. I want to go and do it. Wonderful. Go for it. Who do you think put those desires in your heart? Use them for God's glory. As long as they come to the foot of the cross and we surrender those things. It, I don't make it my mission now and Jesus must fall in line. It's not like that. Somewhere there needs to be a surrender in that heart. In anything and everything that I do, wherever I go, I want to run a marathon this year. Uh, not for real, eh? I'll, I'll die. <laughs> my knees will fall off. I'll die. It might be better in the wheelchair. But I can say something. But unless through all of that, I'm willing to surrender it to Jesus. He'll just let me go in my own free will. Go for it. You want to go there? Go for it. But if we're able to come and surrender all of those dreams and ambitions and allow the Lord to use them in the right time, the right way, glory to God. We must be a people that have ambitions and desires, godly ambitions and desires. How else is the news going to get spread out there? We think that the angels are going to do all the work for us. But for people, they want to go, they want to run marathons, they want to be doctors. I don't know. What do you want to be? Anything. That'll, that'll work. Here we go. My brother Precious, he loves driving the buses. And he loves driving buses with children on. Precious, I hope you are online with us today. Yeah? But that's because he can have interaction with the kids. I can help the kids. Great. Drive for Jesus. Put us fish on your bus if you can. I mean, I don't know what you're allowed to do. But we mustn't just come and quash all of these things and say, oh, I'm a Christian. Glory to God. With nothing in us. I must come. Let, let's, go to, let's go to another verse here. In fact, you know the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler had everything. Ma uh, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, we can go down a little bit. Okay, verse 18. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, Teacher, all of these things I have kept my, whole, my youth. Then Jesus said, looking at him, he loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you, want, whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. It's amazing. The one thing that the ruler didn't have was that submission. And he wasn't able to just surrender all of that. And to take his follow Jesus in that. And for each and every one of us. 
For the rich young Eula, it was all of his great possessions. But for me, it could be my pride that holds me back. For you, it could be something else. You have such a fixation on something. Maybe it's a desire of, of being, I don't know, on a corporate ladder. You want to be this. I don't know what. But somewhere, each and every one of us has an opportunity, just like that ruler, to identify Jesus and say, Lord, you are the Savior of my life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You, that's you. But there's now something for me to do in that. To release and to let go of my life and to start becoming more like Jesus every single day through every situation that happens. Everything that happens to us, church, anywhere you go, whatever happens, there is a way that we can identify with Jesus in that. Or you can allow your carnal man to manifest himself and you react and respond in a very different way. Very, very different way. Each and every one of us have that opportunity. And when we're at that point, something we've held on to for so long, it can be anything. It can be desiring someone to get married to. It can be marriage. It can be children. It can be so many things. You know. But what the Lord is asking for is a surrender. He wants a state of heart that's willing to come and be broken, to be contrite, and surrender that will. Because that desire and that will of mine will keep me from the Lord. It'll keep me from the Lord. It'll keep me going in that direction. And the Lord wants that, that submission to come in our hearts that says, no. And I come back and I say, yes, Lord, your will be done in my life. And you know how the Lord works in so many different ways. Give it a couple of years and he'll bring you, root you right back around to that direction. That sport you love to play or whatever that thing was, career, whatever it was. But you're on a different foundation now. And the Lord knows that you are his son. You are his servant, and he can use you for his glory in any way. Somewhere there's a testing that's happened, and he knows that if he says you need to let that go, you'll say, yes, sir, I release that, and I have, I'm here to receive your will, Father. That's when he knows now this is, there's a safety here. I can send you back over there and know that you know the, the voice of your father, and if so, when I call you, you're going to come straight back. You know, you have a little dog. And you go out. You have to test and see if the dog's going to come back before you unleash it. Our dog is a good example. So he's on his lead. If he stops and I call him back on his lead, we're good. That's a good start. If he never stops and comes back, he's never coming off that lead. <laughs> because when you let him go, he's gone. If he can't respond to you when he's on the lead, he's never going to respond to you when he's found someone else there, another dog chasing. Never. But we are not on a leash, church. We have a free will. But somewhere in us, those that say they want to identify with Jesus, you have an opportunity to come to bring your life to him and say, Lord, your will be done. And that cup won't pass from me because I'm going to surrender my life. I'm going to take my place in your church. Do whatever it is you may have for me and respond in a way. That my pride, my man, whatever, my flesh, the lusts, whatever it is, they get put off. I am the one. I put it off. No one strips it from me. My pride, you can embarrass me, but I'll still be pride inside, proud inside. But I give the opportunity to, I release that pride. And I go back to those situations and I allow the Lord to put things right. Amen, church? Amen. You're all quiet like you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Amen? Matthew chapter 7. I, I thought there were grumbles and moans there. I didn't feel any strong amens there. Eh? A question for you. Are you on the narrow road or are you on the wide road? Please don't answer. <laughs> Mark chapter 10, we're going to go to verse 17. No, no, guys, stay on track here. I said Mark 10. Mark, my apologies, my humble apologies. I'm such a humble guy. Mark 10, verse 17. 
Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what should I do that I may inherit the eternal life? We've jumped, where are we going here, guys? No, 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 guys. No, we've got a problem here, guys. That's the question. Have you answered that question yet? Okay, no, we know, we know that. Hold on one second. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. As I told you it was there. <laughs> no pride. Right, are we finally there yet? Matthew chapter 7, let's have a look here. No, guys, we've got problems here, man. Right, who's here? Matthew 7, verse 21. What does it read? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the what? The will of my Father in heaven. You see, there's a very big difference here between doing my will, saying that I'm a Christian, doing what I want, and the will of the Father. And you can be a Christian for how many years? I've already said 45 years, 55 years, a decade, 150 years. But never once do the will of the Father. And when you get to heaven, you'll say, but depart from me, I never knew you. There's a big difference between my will, my desires, and God's will, and God's desires for my life. And this is why it's so important to be reminded of this today, church. That the cross of Jesus is real and evident in my life. It is real and evident in my home, in my relationships. When I come to church, it's real and evident in the church. You can witness and testify it. You can feel the eminence of Christ. Because it's not man and men and women that are being elevated. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. And there's a fragrance that's emitted when people are willing to say, not my will, but the Lord's will be done. There's a fragrance that comes from that. And when you see them... You see a people in a church where it says, what does the second verse, of, part of that verse say? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but you'll identify with people that are doing the will of the Father. And there is a connection that happens because they are very quick to be able to say, this is of me and I don't want it. Father, what is your will for my life? It's so important, church, because in these days where we're at right now, Call it whatever you want. But if we miss the opportunity of being a disciple and continue as a follower of Jesus, we will never walk on the narrow road and we will never get to our, see our Father. We won't. There's a big difference between a disciple, someone that brings themselves to be discipled. First of all, they are ready to be instructed. Ready to say, okay, if you want me to do that, I'll go there. Must I do that? No problem. Give up that, it's done. Do this, no problem. This discipleship, when I can come and the Holy Spirit can witness and it can start to disciple me. When I read the word of God, no one has to tell me what sin is. I can read the word of God myself and I can the Spirit can witness to my heart and I know what is of God and what is not of God. I shouldn't need anyone to come, Christian or not Christian, to come and say, woof, that is that... Is that a good thing or a bad thing? There should be a witness in my heart already. But this is where we see that I have to ask myself another question. Am I a follower that just goes where everyone, like the church goes and does what they do and, and all the rest of it? Or am I a disciple? A disciple can identify themselves with Jesus. A follower just knows where he went, knows what he did. But there's no real evidence in that person's life. So church, I want us to see this morning, when Paul talks in Corinthians, now let's get this one right the first time, okay? 1 Corinthians, chapter 
chapter 9. One Corinthians chapter nine verse twenty seven. We'll go back to verse twenty six. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to the others I myself should become disqualified. This is Paul witnessing and saying that I myself I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Into subjection of what? Of what? Of who? With the will of the Father. It's not something that I can just oh, do what I do what I what what is it? Do what I say, not what I do. Not at all. But Paul there himself is saying, I am first and foremost must keep myself, my body, and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I should become disqualified myself. He's saying to the, the people there that I have to keep myself in check. It's not just something that I can say to you lot and then just go live like a wild man. Not at all. This is what I'm saying is what the, when you hear the words, hmm, let's leave it there. <laughs> there is a chastening and a disciplining that, in my, that I must personally, I must go through in my life that I can identify in the cross, that I can Truly witness with the Spirit. Otherwise, what you feel from me is principles, is law, is all of these things on how to do X, Y, and Z. Why? Because that's the reality of what's in my heart. Do you think I can transmit something that is not in my heart? I can tell you words. Like I said, we can go back and read the bright red words of Jesus. It doesn't make me like Jesus. There's something that needs to witness in our hearts where I'm, a, I'm surrendering my will, that when I'm able to share the will of God, that when you are seeking the will of God, there's a connection in that. You can identify with the words that are spoken. And that the Holy Spirit may continue to witness to our hearts. And you can hear someone, you can hear something and say, that is a man that is giving his life. I'm not bringing myself up here. I'm saying when you hear someone talk, a brother or a sister, when they hear that someone can say something for Jesus, they can witness. They don't have to see what you look like. They don't have to see you. But they can hear and they can feel something and recognize that there is something in that testimony where that person has put themselves down and taken up their will of the Father. The will of the Father. It's so important, church, that there is fruit in the church Amen? Amen. And you know what? When we're talking about denying ourselves and taking our cross, sometimes condemnation comes flooding in and says, you, you can't do that. You can't do that. But you know what? When you learn in the small things, you take a small step, you can take another step. It's like when you run 100 meters. You can run it 200 meters next time. Slowly, not sprinting. Eh? You can run a mile. But it's small steps. It's small steps. And somewhere when we start on this journey and we learn, we learn to have a struggle, to feel as if we've almost been defeated. But then the grace of God comes in and shows us a way that I can identify through Jesus Christ. And I'm able to say, yes, Lord, to your will. I'm able to have victory in Jesus Christ. It's a small victory, very, very small one, but it's a victory in Jesus Christ. An opportunity where I would have reacted in a certain way. I'm able to say, Lord, thank you for that because I've given way this time. And that is not, that is not me, that is not my character, but that's the evidence of you and your work in my life. I want more. I'm able to do something else. The Lord is able to, is this another situation to bring that right to bring it right. And I start to walk this road that is a narrow road. The opportunity is very wide. But there's something that I pick up on of what God wants for my life and I respond in that way. Small steps. Small things. Small things the Holy Spirit starts to impress on my heart. And I learn to be obedient. Learn to be obedient. Because I can say, no, I'm not doing that. No problem. 
off you go, your free will. And then I walk in circles and circles and circles, and I find myself continually in defeat until I come back to that moment and I say, okay, Lord, first of all, forgive me for doing it my way. Secondly, I want to do it your way. Help me in this time here. I'm able to take a step in that. There's a maturity that starts coming in our Christian walk. And now we are able to see that there's light. When I walk the narrow road, it's difficult, it's challenging. But there is a victory that comes because I'm identifying with the victory of Jesus Christ that has risen on the dead and has conquered my sins for me. There's an identification that comes in my life. Is the road challenging? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. But you know what? Even on the wide road, it'll still be difficult and challenging. The difference is that on the narrow road, I have victory through Jesus Christ. Amen, church. That's the victory. That's why I want to run this race. That when I get to heaven, he, you say, Lord, 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 like I know you. But this person here, I know who you are. You don't even have to call me. I know who you are. I know the testimony that you have. The witness that you have to so many people around you. I know who you are. And I have a place prepared for you in heaven. Come, my son. Come, my daughter. There's a price that we need to pay, church. There's a price that we have to pay. Do you think you get anything in this world for free? Anything. Then it shouldn't be a shock to you. When it comes to that narrow road, there's a price that I need to pay. It's not physical money. In fact, it might be if that's your, if that's your issue. Like the rich young ruler. I can keep all of these things. No problem. Sell your possessions. Ah, I can't do that. No problem. Wide road. Wide road ministries. International. There's something that we need to have a desire for and a hunger for when I come to that narrow road and walk it every single day of my life. The first question, am I on the narrow road here? Here we go. <laughs> am I on the narrow road here? Is this what the narrow road looks like? I want to be able to identify in everything that happens there and I know it's going to be Jesus. There's going to be fruit in my life that emanates from this, this challenge, whatever it is, that you will feel an, the fragrance and see, smell the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Not of a man that has struggled and has, and has made himself a self-made man. I don't want that. I want nothing of that. Everything that I have today is because of Jesus Christ and him alone. I haven't helped him. I haven't guided him. I haven't given him my wisdom. Everything I am today and have is simply from the grace of God in my life. Nothing more. Because I know what it was like to pass at that cup. And it said, I don't want this. And I want in everything in me to reject it. And I want to do my own thing. But I've done that before. And I keep coming back to the same point. Frustration. And you get there and you think there's nothing here in this life for me. The frustration. It so becomes so real. It eats you from the inside out. Some people wear it. Like it's a garment you can change. But it's so real. And then you get to that breaking point in your life. Where your will is broken. And says, okay Lord, I surrender. And now I walk on the narrow road. And my surrender brings me victory in Christ. And I'm able to say that it is nothing of me. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for that. Because that platform that we think we build on for pride, there's nothing there. Because you've done nothing. I haven't done anything. So I, what, what right do I have to be, pri to be proud? It's God's work in my life, not mine. But somewhere, church, we need to see these frustrations that sometimes we struggle with. And realize that we are avoiding avoiding saying yes to God's will in my life. I'm battling, I'm circling, I'm... There's a turmoil that happens. And we need to come back to the cross and say, okay, Lord, your will be done in my life. And surrender and allow the Lord to minister, to work, for that work to be deep in my life. It's sometimes the roots go very deep. They go deep. 
But it's a, a, heart, my, a state of heart that comes and says, Lord, you go however deep you need to go. You uproot whatever you need to uproot. In fact, why don't we just uproot everything just to make sure? Just pull it all out. And we start again, Lord. And you build me up as a man that you want me to be. And when people see me, they don't see me. They see you, Jesus. It's your work. It's the fruit of your work in my life. Nothing more. Nothing more. Amen? Amen. Let's finish at Titus. Titus chapter 2. We go to verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us for every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. Church, there are glorious things ahead of us. And I tell you what, the miracles that God has done and is doing for us each and every single day. As we started off the service, we had that time, an opportunity of gratitude. Where gratefulness and gratitude is a fruit of the spirit that comes from God's work in my life. Father, I'm so grateful for you. For your work that you've done. First and foremost, you have loved me before I even loved you. You loved me before I even loved you. But the Lord has done so much for us, church. And I want to encourage you, somewhere, to dig a bit deeper. To say, Lord, help me. Bring that faith to my heart. Let me have a courage and a boldness to stand up and to say yes to that cup that I'm struggling with. The desires in my flesh are deep, heavy, rooted, but there's a boldness that the Lord is looking for where I'm able to say, yes, Lord. I'm standing in faith this morning that you may continue to do a miracle in my life. And I may put that man down and off and say yes to your will, answering whatever, responding, whatever it is. But there's that challenge that I'm bringing to you today, church, to be bold and courageous, that the cross may have its work in your life, for Jesus to be manifest in everything you do, wherever you go, that the will of the Father may, we may say yes to. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you are struggling with something, that you know what it is, but to come back to Jesus and say, Lord, I am ready to say, not my will, but your will be done. And I want to encourage you that the Lord wants to do a miracle in your life. The moment you let go of that thing, he has something very special for you. And you will have an opportunity to taste of that freedom in Jesus Christ. Because your desire is taking you and it is taking you through frustration. It is taking you one way. But in your heart you desire another way. That time has come to release that thing. And to say yes Jesus. As hard as it is. And it feels. And then just like Jesus we say nevertheless. Your will be done, and I'm here to follow you. Stand up today, church. Stand up. When Jesus was saying those words, he was down, lying face down, face on the, on the floor. There's a time to stand up now and say, yes, I'm going to drink of that cup. There's a boldness that needs to come into our hearts. Faith that says, yes, Jesus. Amen?